Okay. So I'm just going to admit all and then Megan and Ryan, you can continue admitting. Sound good? All right. Hello, folks. Uh, we'll just give it a couple more minutes before we uh, start. But thanks so much for coming. This is where I say we need to have background music. It always, <laughs> you know, it's always so yeah. quiet. I can turn the radio <laughs> on if you want. <laughs> that would help. <laughs> we only have another couple of minutes. Uh, but once again, thanks everybody for uh, joining us. And uh, I'm going to kick off the meeting and then pass it over to my colleagues at SHPO, who we're very lucky to have with us today. We'll give it one more minute. At the stroke of 531, we will start. <laughs> okay. okay, it looks like 531. Uh, I just wanna let everybody know that we are recording uh, and after the presentation, once we get it uh, uploaded, oh, there's somebody we can admit. Uh, Megan, you can do that, right? Okay, great. There we go, great. So, hello everybody. My name's Larry Francer, if you haven't met me, uh, I am the Associate Director of the Landmark Society of Western New York. And we've been working quite a while with a bunch of different people, uh, but always with SHPO, the State Historic Preservation Office, to get this uh, Gregory Track nomination done. So uh, before I introduce my colleagues from SHPO, I thought it might be fun just to talk a little bit about the Gregory Tract. Um, and I am not able to move my, uh, where is it? There we go. The Gregory Tract, where it all began. Uh, it actually began in 2014 when my husband and I bought this house on 40 Nicholson Street, the corner of Nicholson and Wider. And often that's uh, where uh, historic districts start out because someone, uh, often a preservationist knows about the uh, wonderful things that come along with a National Register nomination, but the biggest carrot of all are the tax credits, the historic tax, uh, the historic homeowner tax credit project. Uh, right. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we bought this house and we knew that there was work we wanted to get done. So uh, I started trying to get some interest in the neighborhood. 
the first thing we did was uh, worked with uh, SWIPIC, the South Wedge Planning Committee, because I actually thought that my home was in the South Wedge, uh, but we also realized that uh, SWIPIC was a neighborhood organization, a 501c3, and they would be able to apply for different grants. So we applied to the Preservation League's Preserve New York grant in 2017, and we didn't get it. At the same time, we applied uh, to the Community Foundation for a grant, and we did get it. So we realized that we had this money and we couldn't do the entire nomination. So we hired uh, Barrow Architecture. Katie Como worked with us and uh, we figured out what the most important thing to get done with the amount of money we had. And it was uh, doing mostly the research and writing the narrative of the nomination, that that was the first step. So then 2019, we got, we, I realized that I was actually in the Highland Park neighborhood <laughs> and we spoke with the folks uh, at the Highland Park Neighbors um, Association, HIPNA, and we put in another uh, Preserve New York grant, but at the last minute, we couldn't put it in because HIPNA was not a 501c3, and nobody realized that until the last, the last minute. So in 2020, along with the Highland Park neighbors with HIPNA, we reached out to the Southeast Area Coalition, SEEK, and they were able to be the entity that would put in the grant for uh, the Gregory Tract nomination. And lo and behold, we did receive a $10,000 grant. So that's pretty much where we are right now. That's where I am. Uh, we decided that we really couldn't hold off painting the house, but we have plenty of work that we still wanna get done on the house. And so uh, we're looking forward to this nomination going through and be able being able to access the uh, historic homeowner tax credits. And at this point, and let me just say that that took me a long time to put together because I was going through all of my emails and all of my files to really figure out exactly when we were getting things done. And needless to say, it is not a quick process. And so we have persevered and we are at the point now that uh, the nomination will be submitted and I am going to stop sharing. There, we get to see everybody and uh, hand it over to my colleague, Virginia Bartos at the State Historic Preservation Office. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Larry. Yeah, we've uh, enjoyed working with Katie on this particular nomination. And like you said, it, it started a long time ago. I can remember you driving us around the neighborhood, Katie and myself, looking at the buildings and trying to figure out how far does this historic district go? Well, we finally figured it out and Katie pulled it all together. And we now have um, a, a draft that is going to go towards the September meeting. And everyone in the uh, historic district has been notified through the mail uh, about this meeting. So um, people know that it, it's coming up, okay? Um, and I think what I will do is I'm just gonna give you a little background as to about who the SHPO, what the SHPO is. Because a lot of people, when they get these letters, they're going, what and who and ugh. And so, I think a little background is necessary. So I'm gonna go down to share screen and see if I can get my PowerPoint to start going. Okay, here we go. That should do it. Share screen, all right, okay. 
Uh, the National Register of Historic Places is the program that I work with at the SHPO. And uh, this is just some basic information about what the program is and what the SHPO's role in these historic districts is or what we, our role is in general. Um, and before I go any further, just let me know if you can hear me fine. Uh, uh, okay, great, good, all right. So let me go on. Come on. There we go. All right. So how does this all begin? This begins in 1966 with the National Historic Preservation Act. Okay? And what that did was it established the, the National Register of Historic Places, which is probably the oldest official um, historic preservation program in the United States. And with that act, it allowed for state participation in national historic preservation programs. Um, a few years later, a couple of years later, it authorized the state historic pre preservation offices in each of the states and uh, territories. And they did that because initially there was a state historic preservation officer and they were kind of getting overwhelmed. So they went with the offices instead. And I should mention too, that there was a similar act that was passed in 1980 um, for the state of New York, similar to the Historic Preservation Act. Okay. It, I, I don't want to say it duplicates, but it pretty much mirrors the uh, National Historic Preservation Act of 1966. So um, it's a program that's administered by the SHPO, but we do a little bit more. And here's a list of all the things that we do. We do surveys or we work with people to do surveys of historic resources so that communities can find out what is historic within their, their community. It turns in, it becomes a planning tool Okay. We also administer another um, National Park Service program called the Certified Local Government Program, and Rochester is a certified local government. And uh, long story short, that boils down to they have their own historic legislation, uh, historic preservation legislation uh, within the community or within the city. We also administer tax credit programs. The two basic ones that we do are a commercial tax credit and the homeowner tax credit. And we also work with the State National Register of Historic Places, which is what I am involved in and what this Gregory Tract Historic District is going towards. We're, getting, trying, we're going to get it listed on the State National Register of Historic Places, which allows uh, people in that historic district to take advantage of historic preservation programs on the state and national level. Okay. The other thing we do too, is we co uh, connect with other uh, public and private preservation groups. And in Rochester, our biggest partner is the Landmark Society of Western New York. And the whole goal is to take, we want to help people take a building like this and turn it into this. This so is uh, the building of uh, Hawkins House on Long Island, which was built uh, by a sea captain. Um, and it was later turned into a bed and breakfast. Uh, there we go. Okay. And there are all kinds of things that can get listed on the National Register. People think, you know, it's mostly houses, you know, uh, but no, if we can make, if we can, if a resource fits the qualifications or the guidelines established by the National Park Service, we can get all kinds of things listed like the Canisteo Living Sign, which was a Boy Scout project in the 1930s. They created this, this sign in Canisteo, New York on the side of a hill that was an, air, um, an airplane beacon. And this was in the early stages of um, you know, aeronautics or airplane travel so you had to use visual beacons um, as well and you could, because they didn't have the, the, uh, uh, you know, the guidance material, the, the guidance equipment that we have today. And down on the bottom is the big duck. Um, it was a roadside stand. It was built in the 1930s by a farmer and he used it to sell uh, duck and duck products, duck eggs um, out of this little store along the side of the, of the road. It's now owned by Suffolk County and they use it as their, they're kind of like their uh, you know, headquarters for visitors. 
Um, again, people say, well, what about cemeteries? Yes, we can get cemeteries listed on the National Register. They have to follow certain rules. They have to be like a certain type, like down on the bottom, you see the long uh, image there. That's Oakwood Cemetery, which is a certain kind of cemetery. It's called a um, rural cemetery. And I think for people in Rochester, if you know Mount Hope Cemetery, that's also a rural cemetery. Uh, a cemetery and an important one. And that one is listed on the National Register. There may be a uh, particular uh, architecture in the cemeteries, like the uh, photo above is the chapel in Woodlawn Cemetery in Canandaigua, which I believe they've just finished refurbishing or, or renovating. So if you get a chance to go down to Canandaigua and visit this, uh, it's a wonderful resource. You can also get a cemetery listed because it has uh, fabulous funerary art, like uh, Buffalo's Forest Lawn Cemetery. There's this huge monument there for the Bloker family, um, which has life-size Carrera statues of the mother, father, and their, their son who died. He's their only son. And uh, underneath the, the, uh, the mausoleum, well, the burials are underneath. It's quite a, an amazing piece of artwork. And another reason or another way you can get a cemetery listed is, um, and this is the National Park Service terminology. They say persons of transcendent importance, which, well, you think, what the heck does that mean? Well, to give you the best definition, let's just say that Woodlawn Cemetery, yes, they keep renews, reusing the names, Woodlawn Cemetery in Elmira, um, Mark Twain is buried there and he is considered a person of transcendent importance. At Mount Hope Cemetery, it would be people like Susan B. Anthony and Frederick Douglass. Um, you can also get things uh, listed like churches. People think you can't, but you can. You can't, you have to list them though for their architecture. Um, they have to be, uh, you know, that represent a certain style, uh, or they can represent a certain kind of architecture, like up in the, the top right, um, that is a uh, Quaker meeting house, which is on Long Island, and those followed a certain pattern. Um, below it is a synagogue in Hornell, and those also followed a particular style or particular pattern, right? So, they're being listed for their architecture. And some churches can be listed for their architects, like the First Unitarian Church in Rochester, which was designed by a very famous architect by the name of Louis Kahn. Right. And you just don't have to list individual things. You can list large groups. Like tonight, we're talking about the Gregory Tract. And it's a district. And, what, and the definition from the Park Service of a district is that it possesses a significant concentration, linkage, or continuity of sites, buildings, structures, or objects united historically or aesthetically by plan or physical development. What does that mean? It means they share a common history and they kind of look like they fit together. That's it. And that's probably the easiest way to explain that terminology. Some examples, Watkins Glen Commercial Historic District, um, they share similar kinds of architecture, but one of the things that holds this historic district together is its uh, relationship to racing and the racing community. Another one is the down Geneva Downtown Commercial Historic District, which um, started, got its start from uh, lake travel on Seneca Lake and also um, travel with the Shimon, not the Shimon Canal, but the Cayuga, the Seneca Cayuga Canal. In Brockport, we have this Park Avenue and State Street Historic District, which um, kind of like reflects the, the houses of the people who owned and worked in buildings on the commercial. <coughs> There's a commercial district there too, but these are the people who, this is where they lived, commercial area is where they worked, okay? And there's like, they like butt right up against each other. You can have large districts, you can have small districts. <coughs> the Arvine Heights Historic District in Rochester is one street. And that is, um, and the reason why this got listed is because it was part of a development 
um, in the early 20th century, uh, development by a woman who um, literally, you know, got this area and um, sold it off and got people to build houses here. And this one, Megan will recognize. This is the Clinton Columbia Historic District in Elmira. And the one thing that holds this particular historic district together is the presence of row houses at certain areas and at certain junctures. So um, again, you know, what's the glue that holds this area together? Well, it's these row houses and this certain type of housing. There was also um, a, a, a trolley that went right down the street. So people could literally walk out of their house, get on the trolley and go downtown to work. Now, for uh, a lot of these, uh, for these listings, you know, what are the benefits? Um, because they're state and federal listings, it gives you some protection from state and federal actions, but it also allows you, and this is the private property owner's choice, to participate in tax credits. Like if you have a commercial building that needs a substantial rehabilitation, um, you can uh, participate in the federal program for uh, commercial tax credits, which is 20% of the qualified rehabilitation expenditures. Okay? There's an application process and we usually, I usually direct people to the federal website because it has the best information about it, talks about what it is, what, a, what they mean by a substantial rehabilitation. So uh, I usually direct them there and then they have, have any additional questions, they can talk to us and also the application materials for this program are right there on the website. And then we have the, the New York State Homeowner Tax Credit, which I'm not gonna say a lot about because that's Christina's bailiwick and, she, and she'll talk more about it. But I just wanted to show you this wonderful picture of 288 Wimbledon Road in Irondequoy. The building got listed and what the homeowner was able to do was to strip off the vinyl siding um, and restore the uh, shingles and the stucco work that was being, that was hidden underneath it. And he was able to use the, the tax credit for that. For general information about us and the programs that we uh, administer, I often tell people, you know, we're kind of like the Department of Labor the federal government creates the program and then hands it off to the state to administer. So same thing with historic preservation. The laws are created by the governments and then they're handed off to the CHIPO to administer. So more information about what we do is at nysparks.gov. Well, I think, I need, I think that's wrong. It should be NYS. <laughs> NY, well, anyway, we'll leave that one out. I thought I fixed this, but anyway. Um, there's uh, the, the, uh, the tax incentives for the, the commercial tax credits. And the one that says CRIS, if you're interested in what we've done or what has been done, or if you wanna look up if a particular building in Rochester or your neighborhood is listed on the national register, you can go to chris.parks.ny.gov and look it up because we have all that information there. You know, and again, uh, because we have different things going on within the SHPO, we have different units. I work in the National Register and Survey Unit. So questions like that, you direct those to me. If you have questions about the commercial tax credit, um, they go to our technical unit and the person there is Robin Sedgwick. And, and questions about the homeowner tax credit go to my colleague, Christina, who will, um, talk a little bit more about those tax credits. Um, I wanted to uh, end on this particular slide because it shows the Gregory Tract Historic District. Um, the map that you see there with all the numbers on it, that's the map that goes along with the National Register nomination. And the numbers there, um, if you look down on the bottom, it says point easting, northing. This is to identify to the National Park Service exactly where this is so it doesn't get mixed up with any other historic district in Rochester. And the photographs on the right-hand side are just some of the images from the Gregory Tract Historic District. 
Now, uh, for everyone in the district, uh, they should have gotten um, a letter from us talking about what to do if there are, if you want to send a letter uh, regarding the, his, the district and those letters should be directed to our uh, Deputy State Historic Preservation Officer. If you're sending a letter of objection, please make sure that it is notarized uh, as a requirement by the National Park Service, they will not accept that letter without the notarization. So that's it in a nutshell about why we're doing this, what we're doing, and um, why we're glad to be moving this Gregory track forward. Okay? And like I said, um, any questions, if you know people who aren't here tonight, you know, they can email me or call me. Um, I've been going back into the office four days a week, Monday through Thursday, so feel free to call my number on any Monday through Thursday or uh, send me an email. Okay. Um, that's it, Larry. I, I will stop Great. sharing my screen. Yeah, thank you. Myself uh, go on so, there. That was wonderful. Uh, and uh, just to uh, reiterate, I know we have had uh, more meetings locally on uh, the Gregory Tract. So, uh, and, and those meetings um, are actually on our website and up on our YouTube channel. Uh, this one will be there as well. So please, you know, if there is anyone who you know wanted to come tonight but couldn't make it, please let them know that both of those presentations will be up on the site. So uh, take it away, Christina. I'm excited to become a YouTube star after tonight. <laughs> Okay. Is it showing you guys the right thing or do I have to do that swappy no, thing? No, looks good. Oh, good. Um, okay, so yeah, Virginia sort of mentioned some of the, um, the things that happen after you come a historic district. And one of the huge benefits to homeowners is the Historic Homeownership Rehabilitation Credit Program. And that allows you a tax credit that's equal to 20% of what you spend on qualified expenses on your historic home. Uh, it's a, you have to have income and or file income taxes in the state of New York in order to claim it. So it's not just a, ch a check. You have to, the only way to get it is as a tax credit. Um, and it goes against what you owe in taxes, which is very nice. Um, you have to spend at least $5,000 and do 5% of the work on the exterior. And you can, the way that's set up is like, you can do it over and over again. You can do it, if you wanna do it one year and, and you spend that much money and then you have more work to do the next year, you can close it out, claim it, keep going, or you can keep it open for a while. There's, um, there's a lot of flexibility with it. It's, um, there, I know there's some outdated information that's still floating around somewhere on the internet and I get a lot of questions still, but the program is currently good through December 31st, 2024. So as long as you've submitted the the first part of your application before then, you'll still be allowed to finish out your project and claim the credit. And to be honest, they always reauthorize the program. I would be shocked if for some reason in, in 2024, though, they don't reauthorize it. Um, so it's blah, 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 New York state tax law. Uh, there is, um, we administer the program. It is a tax credit. So tax and finance is dealing with the dollars and cents, but we administer the application process in terms of getting your work approved. And then there is a tax form, like I said, that you have to file to get the credit. Um, you are supposed to submit the application before you start the work. Um, there are emergency situations where, you know, people, oh my gosh, my boiler just quit last week and I and my they're coming tomorrow I can't get my application together we can work with you on that but it's you know we've had people come to us a year later and say oh I did all this work on my house you know last year and I just found out about the program and it's really not up to us to be able to bend that rule that's tax and finances rule and we don't want to get ourselves or you in any trouble by by skirting around that so um We'll, we'll, we do our best to have everyone, you know, take advantage of the program as good as we can. Um, right now, you do have to send it in as a hard copy, the application. We are working. I have a meeting on Wednesday. We're working on a digital submission 
um, process that would also allow you to pay the fees digitally or online. So that is coming someday. But for now, unfortunately, you have to print out the application because we need a hard copy with your original signature. Our reviews can take up to 30 days. Honestly, I mean, I was just out for some family stuff, but I'm still, it's not taking more than a couple of weeks usually to get your application through. And again, like if you have someone, if you've got a contractor who's waiting to paint your house, call me, get in touch with me. We'll figure it out. We'll get you going. We're not going to hold up your work because I know, you know, it's hard to get contractors right now. Um, you take the credit the year that you get your part three approved. So it's a three-part application. Part one and two comes in before you start the work, ideally, describes what you're going to do. We say, sure, this looks good. Go ahead. You do the work. You send in the third part when you're done or, or you know, if you've completed $5,000 worth of work and you've done your 5% on the exterior, you send in the part three. We get you with the certification letter and whatever the date of that letter is, that's the year that you claim the tax credit. So we usually recommend people get their part threes to us by early December, just so that we have enough time to process so that if you wanted to claim it, for example, this year, you'd have to get it in by December of this year. There is a ton, a ton of stuff that is considered qualified expenses. You know, uh, painting, any structural systems, you know, fixing, fixing your windows, even replacing your windows if they're appropriate, uh, you know, putting on a new roof, um, fixing your front steps, uh, all of these things on the list. I don't want to read from a slide, you know, but like th there's pretty much anything you can think of is a qualifying expense. A lot of interior things qualify too. It's a good way to think of it is if you were to pick your house up and shake it, anything that doesn't come loose, is a qualified expense. So, you know, towel bars technically doesn't come loose. You know, if you have a really fancy towel bar, put it as an expense. Wall sconces, plumbing fixtures. Um, the only things that don't count are appliances because like technically you could take those with you if you sold the house. So it's only things that are permanently installed. Like um, if you put in an air conditioning system that has duct work and, you know, it, control unit somewhere that counts but in the wall or through in the window air conditioner doesn't count and your kitchen appliances don't count um but like boiler and those things do um, another thing is if you are doing the work yourself you can't claim the cost of your labor but you can claim the cost of like you know your paint and your lumber and your nails and not tools but the the supplies um count as expenses solar panels can be a qualified expense um, the big caveat is it really has to be minimally visible from the street, ideally not visible at all. So if your house faces south, you're pretty much out of luck in terms of getting the tax credit for solar panels because um, you can't put solar panels on the front of your house. But if you have a garage and you can get them on your garage, we're not going to care and you can still get the credit for it. Um, uh, I already talked about, you know, appliances and things don't count. Anything outside the building footprint. So your walkway, landscaping, tree work, driveways, things like that don't count. Detached outbuildings, like if your garage is freestanding away from your house, doesn't count. If it's attached to your house, go for it. Um, and then anything, we use the Secretary of the Interior's standards for rehabilitation. And, you know, the, the gist of that is, you know, fixing things rather than replacing them. Or if you have to replace them, you're gonna do it with something that's appropriate, you know, like a wood window gets replaced by a wood window. But there are other materials that are acceptable. Please don't ask me if you can put a vinyl window in your house, because I'm gonna to have to give you a lecture on why I can't approve that. So just avoid that altogether if you can. Um, homes that have like a duplex, two family home, you can still qualify for the homeowner credit. You can only claim um, the credit proportionally for outside work and work on shared spaces. So anything on the exterior, um, if you have a duplex and you live in 50%, then you would be able to claim 50% of the cost of painting the house or replacing the roof. You still get to claim 100% of the expense of anything that's in the part of the house that you live in. So redoing your kitchen, but anything inside the rental unit wouldn't count. Also, um, if you have a home office, uh, that you in that ref, that's reflected on your tax filing, then you have to indicate that and you have to use those proportions as well. Um, 
that's, this is my like quick presentation. I, I did it really quick. This is our contact information. I am currently stuck with my children at home until they start uh, daycare in the fall. So don't bother calling me, but I will return your email. Um, so, and if anyone has any questions about, you know, how do I fill out the application? Is, is this thing going to qualify? I'm always happy to help in the instructions that are located at that web address. Um, there's the, you can download the application forms and I would highly recommend to anyone who's even just curious is reading the application instructions because it contains a lot of really helpful information in the last page of that document has a list of qualified expenses and then things that don't qualify. It's not um, all encompassing, but it has a lot of good, good examples of the things um, that you can apply for the credit for. Great. Thank you, Christine. Yeah, that was that was quick. Sorry, but <laughs> I'm trying to just get the the quick and dirty of of right. what everyone needs to know. Right. Absolutely. And in our webinar, we had you know a month or so ago, we went into the tax credits pretty uh, intensely. So great, good. Yeah, and so, I'm glad you did that because I got quite a few telephone calls, telephone inquiries from that. So we were able to to get that information out. And um, if you can't get a hold of Christina and you're looking for like the application or if you're not sure your house is, is eligible, send me an email or give me a call and uh, I can look up that information for you. And I can also forward you the, the uh, application materials. Great, thanks. So uh, we don't wanna keep anybody uh, longer than we have to, but uh, you've got your SHPO representatives here. If you have any specific questions, you can unmute yourself and uh, ask them right now. Uh, otherwise, you can reach out to them by email or Virginia by phone. Uh, <laughs> you can also always reach out to us. Uh, I do have uh, two other members of the preservation team here, Megan Clem and Ryan Jarles. You can find them on our website. Uh, we also have our old house help program. If you think the tax credits sound great, but you just can't deal with them, you don't have time, you don't know what to do, contact us and we'll help you with those as well. Uh, so we'll- I didn't mention the pictures. You're supposed to send pictures too with your application. It's like before pictures comes with the part one and two the after pictures with the part three. It's not super complicated, but basically think of like, you know, you have to be my eyes because I can't come and look at your house to make sure that you've, you know, what things looked like before and after. And we do rely on the pictures to verify that you've done the work. So, you know, you're going to take a couple of pictures of the outside of your house so we can see what the outside looks like. And then just take pictures of all the areas where you're going to be doing work and then, you know, go and take those same pictures when you're done. So, and I can take the pictures digitally. We, I've been sending people Dropbox links to upload and it's been working really well. So um, you don't have to worry about printing pictures or, you know, someone emailed the other day and she's like, oh, I've got to go to office max and have them get the pictures off my phone. I'm like, no, 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 I'm, don't worry about it. So we've, we're trying to make things as easy as possible for people to get stuff to us. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and one thing I want to stress too is make sure you include your email address on the application mm -hmm. because Christina will uh, contact you through email. Great. Well, I don't see anybody unmuting. Uh, Ryan and Megan, anything that you would like? Oh, Stacy, she's waving as well. Go ahead, <laughs> Stacy. <laughs> I would thank you. This was definitely very informative, even though I'm working with. Larry and our neighborhood board, I'm from Hypna. It's good to hear this a lot of times because it is a complex type of program, but it's not that complex sounding as I hear more and more about it. And I do know that we have neighbors that are interested. And actually I have to tell you, whenever I hear somebody who's trying or is thinking about doing work on their house, I'm doing the reminder going, this is what we're doing. Let's make sure before you do anything, you don't want to lose out on a tax credit or possible tax credit. So I think this is exciting. And as I'm sitting here going, yes, my house needs work too. So. Are you in the Gregory Tract or the Highland District? I'm in the Gregory Tract. 
Okay. Right around the corner. We are working on a couple of others, the Elwangerberry Highland and Mount Hope, an expansion there. So yeah. I know because that's what we started. I think it's Larry's Gregory. goal to get the entire city of yeah. Rochester listed on the National <laughs> <Yes>. Register. <laughs> Well, you know, we have beautiful properties. We're a historic city. Absolutely. Yeah, and currently, the entire city of Rochester is an eligible census tract for the homeowner tax credit. Yeah, right. oh, yeah I didn't even mention that because you guys are all set, so you don't even have to worry about that. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Right. That's good to know, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Well, again, yeah. thanks, everybody, for... For joining us. Uh, thank you so much, Virginia and Christina. Uh, thanks, Megan and Ryan, for coming as well. And uh, let's get ready to have a wonderful celebration after uh, we're officially listed. And let's hope you can do it in person. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Bye. You're welcome. Bye bye. Bye-bye.